Hi, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're joining from. Thanks for coming to this talk. My name is Robin Moffat. I'm a developer advocate at Confluent. Um, I'm going to take, talk today all about something called Kafka Connect, which is part of Apache Kafka. I want to explain why we even need it, some of the pieces within it, how to go about getting set up using it, and then show you in action. I'm at I'm off on Twitter. That's me in the uh, top left of the corner. That's my handle. If you want to follow me there, ask me any questions afterwards. I'm always happy to help out and provide additional resources if I can. So let's start off by thinking why we even need something called Kafka Connect. Like, what even is it? Why do we even need it? What Kafka Connect gives us is the ability to do integration between systems upstream into Kafka and from Kafka downstream into other systems. It's a very common pattern, whether we're building analytics, whether we're building applications, getting data from other places into Kafka to work with there to drive our applications, or getting data from Kafka out to other places for analytics or to drive other applications over there. The great thing about Kafka Connect is it's just configuration to use. So you don't need to go and write any code, you just set up configuration, which makes it accessible to a lot more people than if you're using the producer and consumer APIs. So if you're a Java coder, a Go, a Ruby, C Sharp, whatever, that's great. You can still use Kafka Connect. If you're not, if you're from more of a, like a data engineering, kind of data warehouse, SQL type background, using Kafka Connect is just setting up some JSON files to go and use it. So it's very accessible by lots of developers. We can use Kafka Connect for building streaming pipelines, for offloading data from a, maybe a transactional database and going streaming it somewhere else, maybe for analytics. So taking data from a system, streaming it through Kafka, and then streaming that data maybe somewhere like S3. But because Kafka stores its data, and because we don't delete data once we've read it from Kafka, when we push it to S3, we can use that same data and push it to another target. Maybe we want to have uh, cloud-based analytics with S3, maybe on-premises also using something like HDFS. We can also use Kafka Connect when it comes to getting data from applications that we're writing into a target data store. If we're using Kafka already for our broker and we're sending messages to it already, then it makes sense to let Kafka Connect take on that responsibility of pushing data down to a target data store Instead of within our application having to write all the code and the error handling and everything else associated with taking some data and making sure it actually gets written down to that target. Instead, our application just produces an event to the topic and then Kafka Connect is subscribed to that topic and it's responsible for that delivery of the message, that guaranteed delivery down to the target system. Kafka Connect also fits in very well when we're starting to evolve our existing applications and we want to move towards newer, maybe microservices-based ways of doing things. If you think of many existing applications, they're built around databases. You have whatever application it is, and it's using a database for its store of state. An order gets created, a customer changes, some inventory moves, whatever happens, it gets written to a database. Those changes in a database, we can capture using Kafka Connect and stream it into a Kafka topic or set of Kafka topics. And from that, we can then drive our new applications. So we can build event-driven applications using Kafka as the broker, but driven by events that we capture out of existing systems. So there's lots of different uses for Kafka Connect. So I want to give you an idea of what it looks like in action. We're going to take some data from a relational database. We're going to stream it through Kafka, and we're going to unload it into uh, Elasticsearch. So let me show you that, and then we'll talk about like how we're going to set it up and how we run it and all those kind of things. So the demo I'm going to show you comes from this GitHub repository. So the uh, the Confluent Inc. Oops, Confluent Inc. Demo Scene repository, um, and on this there's a whole bunch of. It's mostly based around Docker Compose, so you can use Docker, Docker Compose up. And then it spins up the whole stack and you can actually go and try it out. So I'm using this uh, cheat sheet here today and you can actually follow through step by step everything I've done here. And you can go and try it out for yourself and modify it to your own environment. So that's what we've got over here in my terminal. So we're going to start off in a relational database. I'm using MySQL for this example, but the principles, the concepts I'm showing you, they apply to any relational database. They're all kind of, they fundamentally work the same. And we're going to capture events out of our database and we're going to stream them into a Kafka topic to start with. So let's have a look at the data that we've got. We've got information about orders being placed. 
So I go to my SQL, I say, show me everything in the orders table and just show me the, um, the most recent message. So it says order ID 404, order not found, um, and customer ID, and this is how much it costs, and this is where we delivered it. This is when it was created and when it was updated. It's got data in a database. I'm going to create a data generator. It's just going to start streaming more data into that database. So imagine it's a live system and people are clicking on stuff and entering orders or however orders get generated, they're now being written into our database. Which means if we go back to my database and I say, well, show me the most recent order. In this case, the most recent order is order ID 19, customer ID 546, and order ID 33. So you can see as time ticks by, we have events arriving, or we have data arriving in the database, which are actually events. These are events creating that data in the database. Now let's capture the data into Kafka. So I'm going to come out of my SQL here, and I'm just going to set a little prompt running. I'm using the rather useful watch command, uh, which just re-executes the commands, in this case, every second. And it's just to say to my SQL every second, what's the most recent order in the orders table? So it's a useful way to monitor the data that we're going to pull into Kafka. So that's just pulling uh, my SQL every moment just on the front end so we can see what the latest data is. So now let's get the data in. So the data we're going to capture using Kafka Connect. And with Kafka Connect, we can configure it. There's a web-based front end if you want to. I'm using the command line, but ultimately Kafka Connect is a REST API that we interact with. So you can do it programmatically if you want to. I'm just using curl here. And we're saying, I would like to use the MySQL connector as part of the Debezium project. So there's connectors for lots of different databases. I'm using the MySQL one. Here's where MySQL is at. Here's the table from which I'd like to capture data. And then here's a bit of other configuration stuff, which we'll talk about later on. So we go and create the connector. And Kafka Connect says, OK, I've created that connector. And I can do this, which will say, show me the status of the connector. So I'll clear the screen there. And we run this. So again, this is using the REST API of Kafka Connect. And in this case, it's saying, show me the information about the connectors you've got, and then just reformat it using different shell tools. So it says you've got a source connector. The source connector has got this name, and it says it's running, which means we should now have data streaming into our Kafka topic from MySQL. And we can check this. So I'm going to use a tool called Kafka Cat. So let's go back over to our MySQL window, and let's split that. So on the left-hand side, MySQL. On the right-hand side, a shell prompt in which we're going to run a tool called Kafka Cat. Kafka Cat here is acting as a consumer, and it's pulling in messages from this topic. And let's start off by just doing this. And here we can see all of the messages as they arrive. So if we change it slightly and do this, we can see that formatted messages as they come through. So if we pause that and page up, you can see as the data comes across, you've got all of the payload fields from the original table in a Kafka topic. So you can see you've got an ID, you've got an order ID, a customer ID, the order total, you've got all of the data from the database. And you can see here the order ID is 299. You can see the latest one in the database is 336. So let's actually run this again and let it catch up. And this time I'm going to run it, and I'm just going to filter out and just look at the ID and the create timestamp. Because otherwise we get like screenfuls of stuff and you can't actually see what's going on. But what we want to check is, as data is being created in the database on the left-hand side of the screen, is it making its way into the Kafka topic? So here are the fields we're pulling out, the ID field from the database and the create timestamp. So let's run that. And on the right-hand side now are just those fields from those Kafka messages that we're ingesting. Okay, so on the left-hand side, ID 911, on the right-hand side, there's 911, 913, 918. So basically, as the data gets changed in the database, it's available straight away in the Kafka topic. So we're capturing creates, we're capturing updates, we can even capture deletes also. So we've got that status streaming in from the database into a Kafka topic, and to set it up, I ran one command. I said, let's send this JSON configuration to Kafka Connect REST API, and it said, okay, I will now do this. So once you've got that JSON set up, and I'll walk through what that configuration is in a moment, once you've got that set up, it's actually pretty simple just to set it up running uh, and get it going. Now, let's take that data, and let's take that data from Kafka as it arrives in the Kafka topic, and let's go and stream it into somewhere else. So we're going to stream it into Elasticsearch. 
like this. We're going to say, here is the data in this particular topic, this orders topic that we're ingesting to. Let's take it and sync it down to Elasticsearch, which exists at this point here. So that's now created that connector. But that's kind of like fairly simple. It's like it's pretty useful. But what it also doesn't illustrate is the fact that once we've consumed data from a Kafka topic, it's actually available to use elsewhere also. So we've streamed it over to Elasticsearch, which I'll show you in a moment. But just for good measure, let's also take that same data and go and put it in a graph database. So we're going to put it into Neo4j because that same data are our orders is pretty useful in different ways. We want to have a dashboard that shows that data, kind of like a real-time dashboard for analytics. We also want to have that data and do graph-based analytics on it, or have that same data and go and use it for a bunch of other things. So this is the great thing about Kafka. You ingest that data once, and you can use it many different times, each of them decoupled from the other. If we decide, actually, oh, we don't need Elasticsearch after all, the new 4 j bit just remains as is. We're not like hooking all those different dependencies together. We don't want to be doing that. So let's go and create that connector. And we can say, let's also just check it's all running. So again, I'm using that same command from as before. So this connectors call against Kafka Connect just to see what the status is. And it says you've got uh, a sync connector, two sync connectors, and a source. And all of them are running, which for a live demo makes me very happy. Now, let's go and have a look at that actual data. So we're going to start off with Elasticsearch. And we're going to say, let's go over to our original screen. And on the left-hand side, we have MySQL as before. On the top right, we have our Kafka topic, that data flowing into the Kafka topic. On the bottom right-hand side, we're now going to pull Elasticsearch to say, show me the uh, documents in that index that we're loading. And again, as before, I'm just pulling out the ID and the create timestamp just so that we can see and check what's happening. But we're actually getting a full copy of what's in the database into Kafka, into Elasticsearch. So when I run that, it says, here are the most recent documents. So there's ID 1265, 1263, 1267. And you can see they've passed by already. So let's run that again, 1275. 1279, 1281. So we've got a real time feed of data from a database into Kafka into, in this case, Elasticsearch. But one of the nice things about Elasticsearch is it's got a really nice front end called Kibana. So we can go and put the data into there. Neo4j also has a nice front end. So let's go and put the data and have a look at it through there. So I'm going to put those there and do this. So we'll start off with Kibana and we can see it's loading the data in. And it's actually going to be able to show us the data as it exists within Elasticsearch. And we can now see as something changes in the database, we can get a real-time view of that within Kibana. So you can see how many orders have been created. We could drill down and filter it on different fields or analyze it and look at the delivery cities and the histogram based on those different things and do all of that kind of lovely analytics work you'll do within something like Kibana. But we have the same data that we can now head over to Neo4j with and say, well, let's actually look at it from a graph relationship point of view. Let's see, well, based on where people live, what kind of car are they buying? And this customer over here, did they buy any other cars or where do they live? And they live in Bradford and people who live in Bradford, who are the other people who live in, who live in Bradford? And actually what kind of car do, have they bought? And are there relationships between where people live and the kind of cars they build? And if I'm completely honest, I like using this because it makes for a nice visual demo but the key point is an actually really important one, which is by using Kafka, by streaming data into Kafka, you can then use the best tool for the job at hand. If you want to do graph analytics, you can go and use a dedicated graph database and front end with which to do that. If you want to go and do document search, you can do that. If you want to go and do kind of like big ad hoc number crunching, you can do that by putting the data in the most appropriate place to go and do that. We could take all the data and shove it into one particular technology that's like not bad at doing most of these things. And that's the kind of compromise we've had to make in previous years and decades. Like, here's this one thing, and it doesn't suck at doing many of these things, so let's settle on that. Whereas with Kafka, having data streamed through Kafka, we can consume it multiple times independently into different target technologies to do exactly what we want to do with the data, and also for different teams to do what they want to with the data. So that's the kind of thing that we can use Kafka Connect for. I'm just going to shut down the demo here because otherwise my machine's going to go on a go slow. But if you want to go and try this out, head over, let me show you again, to the demo scene repository. 
So this is the demo scene repository here. So Confluent Inc slash demo scene. You've got the demo here called Zero to Hero, Kafka Connect Zero to Hero. And you just check it out, Docker Compose up, and you've actually got the full script there to go and try it out with. So you can actually go through this and try different pieces. So let's now have a little think about what's going on within this box that we call Kafka Connect. So Kafka Connect works as both a source uh, into Kafka and a sync from Kafka. So the slides I'm going to show you here go from systems through Kafka Connect into Kafka. If you want to think of it from a sync point of view, you just mirror the image. So you can, you'll see what I mean with that in a moment. So to start off with, we have the actual connector itself. So Kafka Connect is a pluggable framework, and we plug in the particular connector that we want to use. And we specify that in the configuration. We saw that configuration I showed you earlier. We say the connector class is this particular connector. So if we wanted to write data from Kafka to a database, we'd say we're going to use the JDBC sync connector. I would say here's the topic, and off you go. What the connector is responsible for, if it's a source connector, is using the API of the source system to ingest data. It says, I would like to make a JDBC call to a database, or I'm going to read the bin log of my SQL, or I'm going to talk to this JMS queue, or whatever the technology specific integration is, that's what the connector plugin does. If we're talking about a sync connector, it does the pushing the data down to that target system. But the connector plugin is the only bit that's specific to the technology with which we're integrating. So if it's a database, that's the only bit that like talks databases, even knows that it's talking to a database because Kafka Connect is modular. And what the connector plugin does is it passes a generic representation of the payload internally within this kind of like black box or green box of Kafka Connect. So this connect record has information about the actual payload, like the values, and also the schema, and also like stuff about the source system, like what the offset was and stuff like that. So we have a schema, like here are the fields of the data, here are the data types, we have the payload, Order ID was 42, the total value was $63. So that's what makes up the record. And that could have come from a database, from a message queue, from anywhere else where we're getting data. Now we have to get that data down to Kafka. And what happens here is, and this is a really important point, particularly if you're thinking about writing a connector yourself, the connector plugin, so like this bit here on the screen, does not write to Kafka. It simply passes the message within Kafka Connect and it pushes, and the converter itself pushes it down to Kafka. So, oh, my headphones are playing up. There we go. So, the connector itself passes this generic representation. The converter plugin writes the message to Kafka or serializes the message for it to be written to Kafka. So message on Kafka are just bytes. So we select a converter, which says, okay, I'm going to take this representation of the data, the payload and the schema. I'm going to serialize it into a way that we can store it in Kafka. You may well ask, well, how do we serialize it? How do we choose which one? And this is a very important choice for you to make as the person writing a source connector, how am I going to serialize my data? If you're using a sync connector, you have to go to the person who wrote that data and said, well, I hope you've chosen, made a good choice here and not a bad choice, but you have to go with what they, they've chosen. So a converter will say, I'm going to take this payload in this schema, I'm going to serialize it using Avro or Protobuf or JSON schema. And here it will actually use the schema registry to store that schema and it will write the actual uh, binary representation data onto the Kafka topic. We could serialize it as JSON. We could serialize it as, as, as CSV. But that's a fairly bad idea most of the time because you're throwing away the schema. That's not usually what we want to do. There are exceptions, but we don't usually want to be doing that. Usually we want to have the schema because the schema lets us build end-to-end -end pipelines and applications. Schemas act as the contract, the APIs between the pieces of the puzzle that we're building. They let us see, oh, we've ingested some data from a database in this case. So our connector, our producer says, okay, I'll take that schema, I'll start in the scheme registry, I'll push a representation of that message, just the payload itself, onto a Kafka topic. And then it will say, when I come to consume that data, if I decide to use Kafka Connect in this case, or just a normal consuming application, it can connect to the schema registry, it can pull down the schema, and it can push it to the target system. But not only are we pushing the payload to the target system, we also have the schema. 
if we're writing to a database, if we're writing to HGFS, if we're writing to a target system which has a concept of a schema, however loosely formed, we can go and build that schema object. We can go and run the DDL in the database to say, here is this orders table. It came from MySQL originally, and we're going to go and create it in Postgres or Oracle or um, create it in Hive or BigQuery or anywhere that supports schemas, we can push that data down to. If we're consuming the data with an application, we've used Kafka Connect to ingest the data from the database, and now we're consuming it directly with our application. Our consuming application connects the schema registry, it gets the schema, and now as application developers, we have the schema available to us. So it's a very good idea. We specify which converter to use using a configuration. We can specify it globally within the Connect Worker configuration. I'll talk about Connect Workers in a moment. We can also override it per connector. You may well want to override it if you're writing a sync connector and the person writing the data onto the topic is using a serialization format that isn't the default. So you'll say, no, we want to use Avro or Protobuf throughout because that's a great way to do it. Another team says, here's some JSON data or here's some CSV data. So you may want to override the converters in that case. The converters are specified per key and per value. So Kafka messages are key value bytes. So you say, here's how we're going to serialize or deserialize the key. Here's how we're going to serialize or deserialize the value. There's something called internal converters. These have been deprecated quite a while ago, but you may well come across them on like Stack Overflow and things like that. You basically don't have to use them anymore. You shouldn't use them anymore. So if you see internal converters mentioned, just ignore them, unless you're on like a super old version of Apache Kafka. Now, the other piece of this pluggable um, wondrousness that is Kafka Connect are single message transforms. And these are optional. So you have to have a connector. You have to have a converter. You can opt to use a transform. So this is the bit of the puzzle where I was saying like you can do it, read it from left to right if it's a source. If you think you know a sync, then we reverse it. It's a mirror image. So a sync would use the converter to deserialize the message of a Kafka topic. It would optionally pass through a transform, which I'll explain in a moment. And then it would pass that generic representation of a message, payload and optionally a schema, to the connector, which would then write the data to the target system. Either way, transforms can sit in the middle of that pipeline, either ingest or egress, and they let us transform that data as it passes through. So it could be something lightweight. It could be simply saying, change the name of the topic that we're going to write to, add on a date or a timestamp. It could be changing data types. It could also be doing more complex transformations if appropriate. Configuring single message transforms is not the most elegant configuration I've ever seen, but it does make sense if you kind of plow through it. Use a transforms prefix in the JSON, say here's some transformation configuration, and then each transformation has got a label. So the label is just a label. You could give it a silly name, you could give it a useful name, and then each transformation has got additional configuration. So in this case, we've got a transformation called label foobar. Label foobar says, well, the type is a replace field, and then within that, we've got additional configuration. So it says, rename delivery address field to shipping address. So that could be saying, when we write data out to this target system, it needs it mapped in a different way. Or we're ingesting data from a source system, and we need to standardize the names of the fields as they arrive in the Kafka topics. And you can drop fields, and you can mask fields, do all sorts of good stuff like that. Where you wouldn't use single message transforms is when you're wanting to do things like stateful aggregations, or you want to maybe do joins out to other data sets. That's where things like Kafka Streams and KSQL DB would very much come into their own. So what this gives us is a very flexible, powerful, extensible architecture. We can plug and play with lots of the different converters, different connectors, and transformations as well. You can write them if you want to. It's an open API as part of Apache Kafka. So if you want to use a particular serialization method that for which a connector, a converter doesn't exist, you can go and write your own. If you've got some newfangled technology that there isn't a connector plugin for, you can go and write your own. But a lot of the time, these connectors and converters and transformations already exist. So head over to Confluent Hub. You can search for a particular technology or converter or transformation that you want, and you can install it from there. So how would we actually go about installing things and running things and doing all that kind of good stuff? Let's think about now how we deploy Kafka Connect, what the actual model of that looks like. We have a logical, convert, uh, logical connector. Converters, connectors, are, it's, there's too many different Cs. 
we have a logical connector. In this case, it could be an S3 sync. We've got data in the Kafka topic, we want to stream it to S3. How that actually gets carried out, how that work gets carried out, taking the data from a Kafka topic and pushing it to S3, is done by a task. So this is like an like, um, execution bit. And we can have a different connector, JDBC source, reading data in from a database, pushing it up to S3. So we have two tasks that are carrying out this work. Well, connectors can actually be executed by one or more different tasks. So you can parallelize the work. So parallelization is configurable both by the user, you can say, I would like to parallelize it by this, but also by the connector author. So when you write a connector, you say, well, I'm doing workload here that can be parallelized based on, I don't know, if we're talking about databases, maybe tables. So tables are our unit of parallelism. Or if you're doing something which only makes sense in serial, you can say, well, even if the user says to increase the number of tasks, I'm only going to do one because it wouldn't make sense to parallelize that work. So you can parallelize that work but to speed up the rate at which you ingest or egress data from the system. These tasks themselves are still kind of like conceptual things, but they get carried out, they get executed within a worker. So a worker is now actually our JVM process that is what we kind of spin up and what we can see running. So the worker carries out these different tasks. How we deploy the workers is up to us, and we've got a very important decision to make. So important decisions include how we're going to serialize and deserialize our data. Also, how are we going to configure our worker or deploy our worker? There's two different modes, standalone and distributed. And the reason I kind of make a great big thing about this is that the one which you may assume is the right one to start with oftentimes isn't. So cut to the chase, distributed is usually what you should be using even on a single machine. So the reason for that is that a standalone worker is not fault tolerant. It just uses local files for configuration, for tracking offsets, like the processing stage that we've got to. And if you lose that worker, your, your processing stops. But the way in which you configure a standalone worker is different from distributed. So at some point you're gonna say, well, standalone, I'm gonna to need to move over to the other way of doing things and now I have to relearn things. But anyway. Assuming you stick with standalone, if you have a single instance and it's running these different tasks and you say, now I need to scale, now I need to ingest data at a greater rate, you say, well, all I can do is scale it and actually separate out my connectors. So I have two different workers, they're completely isolated. One of them runs the workload for one connector, one of them runs the workload for another connector. If I lose one of those machines, that connector stops working. And also, if I want to scale beyond this, so like maybe our, our worker on the left-hand side there that's doing the JDBC work, if we want to scale and say, well, we've got two tasks executing there, can't we like scale those out? You can't, because you can only run one connector per worker. So this is why distributed is so much a better idea, because a distributed worker, you still run it on a single node to start with. So that demo that I showed you, it was all running on my laptop, but it was a distributed worker. So we can configure it in the same way, whether it's one node or many. And the great thing is it uses Kafka as its store of information. So configuration and state and offsets and all that kind of stuff is stored in Kafka. So there's no local files, there's no kind of states held locally on our workers. So we can scale our workers out. We can add in additional workers into the group. They simply connect to Kafka. They say, okay, give us the configuration. I'm part of the group. And now it will start spreading the workload out across it. And Kafka Connect manages that workload distribution for you. So it's okay, well, I've got three tasks. I've got two workers. Let's run this one over here. And it's fault tolerant. If we lose a worker, Kafka Connect says, okay, well, let's make sure these tasks keep on executing. I will move that back over onto this one. And you can scale out your distributed workers, one, two, many different workers, as your requirements are for throughput and for res resilience. You can also partition your distributed workers. You don't have to just have one great big cluster. So you can say, well, we're going to have one cluster over here that's responsible for this team's uh, integration work. We can have one cluster over here that's responsible for this one, or this one's going to be integration with just this particular um, set of technologies that need to connect to this particular network, and so we isolate those. Or you can architect it however you would like. Different companies have different topologies, but the point is distributed has fault tolerance. Distributed uses Kafka for its state store. It's the same effort to set up, 
And when you come to configuring it, it's much easier to start off with distributed because distributed is usually how you're going to run it in production. We can run our Kafka Connect workers once we've settled on which way in which to run them. We can run them on bare metal. We can also run them in containers. So whether you want to use Docker or Kubernetes. So there's a base image that's provided that gives you the Kafka Connect runtime. And then into that image, you need to add in the jar files. So the jar files for your uh, connector plugins, for additional uh, converters, if you've got some bespoke ones. And there's different ways to do that. Most of the time, you'll be getting it from Confluent Hub. So you can install it directly from there. You can add it in at runtime. So if you look at the Docker Compose that I showed you in that demo, this is how I do it, because it's very easy for prototyping. Because as you bring the container up, it installs the particular jar files that it needs, and then it launches the worker. But probably you'll find up when you're using this thing in production, you actually move through the stages. That may be a little bit too kind of flaky, a bit hacky. So then you would build your own image. <coughs> Excuse me. So you'd build your own image. You would say, I'm going to take the base image, I'm going to extend it, I'm going to add in the additional um, uh, jar files that I need and build my own image. You can also automate the connection, the creation of connectors. So you can say, I'm going to uh, wait for the worker to start up and then send it the REST API call to create that connector as well. So you can automate all of this stuff as much or as little as you would like to. So we've talked about why we need Kafka Connect for building pipelines, how the different pieces inside it work, our converters, our plugins, our transformations. We talked about how it even works and how we deploy it and what workers and tasks are. Now let's think about how we actually go about troubleshooting it when things go wrong, because invariably things will. Kafka Connect has got quirks, and I think it's a fantastic piece of technology, but to be completely honest, and it's kind of what drove me writing this talk, is that there are some sharp edges which often catch people out. And like, I'm on Stack Overflow and Twitter and different Slack channels quite a lot, and you see people hit the same kind of problems. So I wanted to flag these up here. One of them is the serialization and deserialization that I talked about earlier, and we're going to look at in a moment. Another of them is Kafka Connect's uh, model of tasks and uh, workers and connectors, because you can get some funny answers based on what you think is happening in your pipeline. So let's imagine we've built this source connector, and it's supposed to be streaming data into Kafka. And we say, well, I'm not seeing any data in my Kafka topic. Why not? Well, the logical thing to do would be to go to Kafka Connect and say, what's the status of the connector? I've created a connector, and it should be reading data from the database. And Kafka Connect says, your connector is running. And you go, well, but that's really weird, because I've not got any data. Where is my data? It says the connector is running, but I don't have any data. And then you say, aha, the task within the connector is failed. So it's, it makes sense if you kind of like look at it, but it also it's kind of frustrating as a developer because you, you'd expect it to roll up, but it doesn't for different reasons. So when you're debugging, you need to look at the status of the connector and also one or more tasks that exist within that connector for execution. What's the status of those different tasks? So once you found there's a particular problem, you then need to say, well, I'm going to say what happens within that particular task? Why has it failed? You can use the Kafka Connect REST API to say, what's the stack trace for that particular task? And it says, well, here is the error, and that might be enough. A lot of the time, though, you want to go to the log files. And the log files for the workers give you all of the information. So connectors themselves, all of their uh, output logging happens in the worker. And people have been asking this for ages. Can I log my connectors to different log files? And you can't do that. But there have been recent improvements, which mean that you can tag different connectors in your worker log file to make it much easier to find out what's going on. Anyway, you get your log information from the worker log file. Where that log file is depends on how you've deployed that worker. So if you've deployed it using Confluence CLI, it'll be one place, Docker, another one. If you've installed it as a service, it'll be somewhere else. But the log file will look the same. A really useful thing that was added recently is the ability to set the logging dynamically. So this is less so for kind of like, well, I just want to change it all to info or all to trace. But actually, when you start debugging things and you want to find out what's happening in a particular logger for a particular connector type at a particular point, you can say, right, I'm going to bump this one up to trace. And then instead of kind of like your whole worker log just going exploding into trace messages for everything, you can pinpoint particular uh, loggers. So it's a really useful thing to do. 
When you're looking at the log files, you'll often see this kind of thing. You'll see task is being killed and will not recover until manually restarted. That's actually a symptom of what's gone on. It's not the cause. So what you need to do is you need to page up and you need to say, okay, I've got my actual, uh, this is the symptom here. It looks like a task has failed. Why is it failed? Well, we page up and here's the task itself saying, this is why I failed. So it was a connect exception and it turns out I couldn't connect to this. So that was the actual reason for the failure. What do we do when things fail? Well, in this case, it's something to do with the source system. So we go and fix that. But sometimes it's more to do with things like serialization and deserialization. So let's kind of wrap up things by looking, walking through an example of how we can do error handling within Kafka Connect. This little error here sounds fun and it's not. It comes up a lot. If you start out with Kafka Connect and you don't hit it, I'll be kind of surprised. Most people do. It makes sense if you've kind of like worked with this thing for ages and you can like work it backwards. It's like, oh, of course it's that. But to start with, it's one of the kind of like most perplexing errors to get. It's like, what on earth's going on here? What's going on here is Kafka Connect is saying, I'm using the Avro converter and the Avro converter is trying to read data from a message that's not Avro. And Avro messages and Kafka have got a little byte on the front of them, which have information about the schema ID. And the Avro converter is basically saying, the magic byte is not there, I don't recognize it. So it's a very um, sideways way of saying, this doesn't look like Avro data to me. But what do we do when we've got it? It could come around for different reasons. It could simply be, we don't have Avro data on our source topic. So we're setting up a sync uh, connector and our sync connector is configured to use the Avro converter incorrectly. It should be configured to use the JSON converter. We set it to use the JSON converter, we restart it, it reads the messages as JSON and happy days, things are working. Sometimes though, it's not quite as simple. It could be we've been bashing the keyboard with our sources and we've been writing bits of data to the source topic, a bit of JSON, a bit of Avro, a bit of Protobuf, a bit of who knows what. And so our source topic, and obviously not in production, hopefully, but certainly in our development environments, we've got a mishmash of stuff on that source topic so we point our Avro converter at it, knowing that oh, we've, we've definitely written some Avro, but it turns out all well, other messages it's gonna read through aren't Avro. So by default, it's just gonna stop. It could also be that we've got Avro messages on that topic, which is what we're expecting, and then another team are sending us messages in JSON. So maybe this does happen in production. Hopefully not, but worst things have happened at sea. So one team says, here's your data in Avro. It's the same logical data entity. Here's it in Avro. Here's the data in JSON. Not a great idea, but it might happen. So by default, Kafka Connect is gonna say, if you give me data that I cannot deserialize, I'm just gonna stop. We don't always want that. Sometimes we might wanna say, I would like to take that data and I'm gonna take that data. And if I hit an error, then I'm gonna say, just keep on going. So like YOLO, errors tolerance equals all, here go the messages. They just go straight through down to the target if I can process them. If I can't, I just ignore them silently, which isn't a great way of doing things because then you're silently ignoring errors. You can, you can enable logging and say, if you hit a bad message that you're gonna ignore, at least log the fact that you've ignored it. But we can take it a step further. We can say, if you hit a message that you cannot process, then route it to a dead letter queue. And our dead letter queue is a Kafka topic. So now we don't bung up our pipeline. Our pipeline doesn't stop when we hit messages we can't process. We're not throwing away messages that we can't process. We're actually capturing them on a Kafka topic. And we can go and inspect them. The header of the messages will have information about why it was rejected. And if it's this example I cited earlier of, perhaps we genuinely have valid data in JSON and Avro, we could say, well, it's a Kafka topic. So let's point another connector at that dead letter Q topic and use the JSON converter this time, and now happy days, we can actually process both sets of data. Finally, how do we even monitor things and make sure we know what's going on? We can use the REST API, I showed you that in the demo, you get various bits of information out using that. You can use Confluent Control Center, it can tell you kind of like the throughput and the lag and what's going on there. There's also JMX metrics. So you can say, I'm gonna um, go down, I want to look at some low level things. A good example here is the dead letter queue. So you could say there shouldn't be any messages on the dead letter queue, but if there are, we want to instrument that, we want to be able to set an alert if we see messages on the dead letter queue using a particular JMX metric. So that is Kafka Connect in a fairly large nutshell. 
That's hopefully given you enough to understand why we should be using it and how to go about using it and some of the kind of like pitfalls and speed bumps along the way that you may hit. If you want to learn more, you can go and try it out for yourself on Confluent Cloud. Now, some of those speed bumps you won't hit because on Confluent Cloud, it's managed uh, connectors for you. It's also managed Apache Kafka and managed KSQL DB. So you can go and try that out there. There's a bunch of codes on the screen for you to take advantage of as well uh, for money off your cloud bill. If you want to run it on premises or if you're using Confluent Cloud anyway, if you just want to learn Apache Kafka and Confluent Platform, developer.confluent.io gives you a great set of resources. There's blogs, there's podcasts, there's tutorials, there's videos, there's all sorts of stuff there. More stuff about Kafka Connect, about Kafka, about Kafka Streams, the whole ecosystem. There's a bunch of resources there, so go and get started with that. Finally, we've got a very welcoming community. We've got a Slack group um, that you're more than welcome to come and join. Uh, the uh, hashtag connect channel is one of the most active ones on the group. So do come along there uh, with any questions and to join in the community. So with that, thank you very much for your time. I'm at Armoff on Twitter. You can find more of my talks at that address in the middle there. And come on to my YouTube channel. There's a ton of Kafka Connect uh, talks on that channel particularly. So do go and check those out. So I'll head over to Slido now. Uh, let's see if anyone has any questions. Okay, no questions. Surely someone must have some questions. I'll tell you what, is anyone using Kafka Connect today? So type it into the thing. Um, I'd be interested in using Kafka Connect. If you hit any of these problems, are you using Kafka and kind of like, looks like Kafka Connect might be useful to you? It'd be useful to get some kind of uh, feedback or interaction. And if not, the, uh, I'll be on the Zoom chat in a moment after this as well, uh, if you want to join that and ask your questions live.